because the sun never came up. <laughs> We've been up all night. I mean, all day. I mean, are we live here? Are we finally live, ready to rock and roll with everybody for a little bit of This Week in Science? Yes. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Live, live, live. And I see Gord is in the chat room. I'm glad you made it, Gord. Yes, Kevin, there was a day today. There was a day. We're still living it. It is the endless day of days. Blur's day becomes Blur's hours and Those are mine? Is that <laughs> my day and my hours? They're all Blur's day. They're all Blur's, Blur's day. day. <laughs> I didn't know I was bequeathed to them. <laughs> this is the This Week in Science podcast, and we are broadcasting our live recording of our podcast here, wherever you are. I hope that you are able to enjoy the show. I see Alex Troiano in the chat room over on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Yes, he wrote our song. You'll hear it in just a few minutes. My internet decided to work again. Sometimes you just have to turn things off and then turn them back on again. And then maybe they decide to work. And that's kind of nice. Have we done that with life yet? Just turn it off and turn it back on. The world. <laughs> 2020. Turn it off. Turn it back on. Okay. Enough of that. It's time for us to actually start recording our show. Identity Force says that we all sound great. I'm going to turn myself up just a little bit because I know I turned myself down earlier this week. So just give myself a little bit more of that gain action. Okay. Let's start the show in three, two, this is twist this week in science episode number 790 recorded on wednesday september 9th 2020 how the west was burned Ooh. hi everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on twist we will fill your head with pain bodies and <laughs> Jeans, <laughs> but first, <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Whatever you are doing right now, wherever in the world you might be, keep an eye out for something interesting. Listen to a sound you might not have otherwise paid attention to, or some detail in your environment that went unnoticed before. Look and listen, observe the world of nature. Life in all its many forms evolved over billions of years, overcame every possible earthly obstacle to exist. What could you learn from that? Look and listen, observe the world of technology, accelerating our evolution with the first stone tools, giving us the cutting ability of sharp claws that nature had overlooked. And lastly, with the ability to adjust the genome itself, influence if not control our evolutionary future. Look and listen to the subtle creatures and objects around you and know that it's connected, all connected to observations made long ago and being made now. Observations yet to be made by generations yet to come. And all of these observations and noticings of things, when backed up with a little bit of knowledge, connect to that first mitochondrial eve with you and you with This Week in Science. Coming up next. Oh. Poosh. Ah, wait, it turned on the wrong place. Hold on. You know, we have the writer of the song. That... I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. 790, 10 away from 800. You'd think we were burning it up. 
Too soon. You know, you know what we should do for Too soon. episode eight hundred is yeah. we should probably all get together and do something really fun. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had all these plans for a episode 800 slash 20 years of twists kind of get together. And then and I wait, went, and this year is wait. just a do over. Why would <laughs> the, the, the plans will happen. We'll make it happen. Internet togetherness is a thing. That's yes. fine. It's fine. It's fine that way. It's, it's fine that way. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope wherever you are, you are safe and you are, uh, you, I hope that you are safe. The, the West is on fire. There are so many fires right now and they're growing and they are combining and towns are being burned, homes are being lost. And uh, I did joke just a moment ago, but it is a very, very serious situation and Part of it is climate change, and the news has not really been dis discussing the fact that climate change is responsible, in part for the heating, for the odd wind situation that we have up here in the Pacific Northwest that is fanning the flames. Um, climate change is a definite part of the increased burning of the West, and so that kind of information is very important. So I, I urge you to... If you haven't yet, after all our conversations on this show, maybe take a moment to think about uh, how climate change is affecting your local environment. Yeah. So, I mean, climate change doesn't cause fire, but it makes fires more common and burn longer and hotter and farther, especially with drought. It's there's more. It just it burns yeah. faster. It burns faster. It burns farther. So it's definitely. Yeah. It's, I, I think that's why we don't hear a lot about it. It's in the nuance. The nuance. Well, People what it want to is, get into the nuance in the in the new nuance. That nuance is like speeding up desertification of California is what yeah. it is. So uh, we have science coming for you. I have science about what did I bring? I have I can't find my little 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 cube that tells me stories about stress. I have frigid birds. They're very cold and milk drinking. Because it's mm. something I can't really do. Uh, what do you have, Justin? I've got a fish that can walk, a new ancient ape discovery. What makes people from Vermont the toughest in the nation? Goose eggs in the search for alien intelligence. And what biker rallies and church leaders have in common? Oh, very interesting. All right, commonalities. It's where you start conversations. And Blair, what is in the animal <laughs> corner? Oh, I have dead bodies. I have uh, <laughs> naked, deaf animals, and I also have endangered species. Well, thank you for bringing the fun. Always. <laughs> <laughs> that is twist. If you have not yet subscribed to our podcast, you can do that anywhere podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. We are also on YouTube and Facebook. We are almost to 14,000 subscribers on Facebook. So if you're over there on Facebook right now and you haven't subscribed yet, click that little, little button and get the notification bell while you do that as well. And you can find our website at twistwis.org, twist.org. That's where our website is with all sorts of information. But now, time for science. Quick science summaries. Okay, with all the stress lately, do you feel like sometimes you just can't sleep? Like yes. you're like, I'm so stressed out and I can't yes. sleep and I wish I could sleep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was me yep. on, what was it, Monday night? I barely slept. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. And it doesn't help anything because it just kind of makes it worse. Why? That's what researchers have been wondering. And we know it starts in the brain somewhere. And researchers decided to look at the neurons in the brains of mice. They looked at the neurons in an area of the brain called the lateral hypothalamus and also looked at what are called uh Oh, but things are loading in front of me. The paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, where corticotropin-releasing hormone neurons live. Wow. 
Yeah. What they found is that when the mice were restrained, that stressed, that's a, a, we, a known stress function on mice. When they were restrained, the mice uh, released they, their, the neurons that are in this area of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, the corticotropin releasing hormone neurons, got active. These corticotropin releasing hormone neurons, they released corticotropin releasing <sighs> hormone, which is a hormone that goes on to lead uh, to the development, the release of cortisol, the stress hormone that we know of. Additionally, they signal to hormones that are called hypocretin neurons. And these hypocretin neurons, they kind of elicit a hyper arousal. And anyway, the end story is they have found the neurons in the mouse brain that keep you awake at night when you're stressed out. So burn, they have found just burn them. them off, right? Just, <laughs> just get rid of them. <laughs> well, actually, when you say that, but you say that, it was like it's a joke, but maybe, maybe there is a way to like earlier in the day induce that stress release those neurons already so they're gone before you go to bed maybe that's or exercise maybe it's burning them off a nice yeah. sleeping yep. cap that just uh, you know electrocutes that exactly. area just zap. or genetic modification oh, in the yeah, case that. Of, yeah there's that in the, the case of these mice genetic ablation of the neurons that are involved or a uh, a knockdown of the gene actually taking the gene out making sure it stopped working counteracted this restraint stress induced hyper arousal hmm. so if you get rid of the genes you get those neurons so they're not activated yeah, the response goes away. You can go to sleep at night. Basically, they found that when they did that, they ablated the neurons or got rid of the gene in the mice. When they restrained them and stressed them out, they still slept like babies. It was just hmm. fine. It was just what, fine. They, and but what you're not bringing up is that what they also found is that the mice found it uh, had a tendency to fall asleep while driving. <laughs> They just didn't, didn't, They're not getting the stressed urgency, out at they, all. They got tired. The urgency of the situation didn't cause any sort of stress so. reaction. That's an anymore. interesting point. Yeah, you kind of need that. It's, it's there for a yeah. reason. That's why yeah. the cap would be great, right? It's just like a switch. Like, okay, it's bedtime. Time to turn this off now. What is yeah, this? maybe inventing, maybe someday you're inventing magical hats now. What yeah, is this magical I, hat? no, no. Someday it's just going to be Elon Musk's, you know, little little insert into oh, your head. Oh, then I just open my phone bit. and go sleep mode. Sleep mode. <laughs> go <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they also connected this specifically to uh, a a change in the immune system. They found by looking at the peripheral blood that there was actually changes to immune cell distribution and functional changes in the peripheral peripheral blood um, related to those immune cha cell changes. So what they're finding is a connection between those neurons being turned on in the brain, the hyperarousal starting, stress and lack of sleep and the immune system all being tied together. So it ties together a mechanistic loop for all the complaints that we have about getting stressed out and not being able to sleep and then getting sick or not feeling good afterwards. Yeah, yeah I think uh, somebody maybe. made a joke in the chat room, but I would be very interested to see what happened uh, if they were dosed some marijuana. Or I don't know. Maybe that helps wine. to reduce that. Yeah, or a glass of wine. wine. Or there's some warm milk. That's Damn. also a thing. People this, that's what I'm saying. We'll like, talk about milk we know later in the show. What to look at? You could actually test a bunch of home remedies for sleep yeah. and see what works on that area of the brain. It turns out, after mm -hmm. much scientific study, that moonshine, white lightning, <laughs> uh, specifically, uh, <laughs> seem to contribute yeah, to it. I don't, know if any of these things, yeah, I don't know if any of these things are going to be like specific to an area of the brain. They're going to be just like, and go to sleep now. And yeah, override. It's, just, it's, like, sure. it's more of the General shotgun over. approach, right? Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. But maybe there is an approach that would be more specific sometime in the future. Yeah. For all that stress. Okay, so from stress, let's move on to pain. Justin, uh, do you have a pain story? Yeah, so, okay. Actually, on uh, today's date, September 9th, but uh, 1776, 
the United States became the United States for the very first time. Thanks to the Congressional Congress uh, adopting the term officially, uh, it had been in the Declaration of Independence a few months prior, July uh, 2nd, and then published maybe July 4th, which is why it's, it's kind of a big deal day. But it was still, at that point, the United Colonies. Not until the September 9th that we became the United States. And while the word United is right there in the name, America's rarely united uh, around how it feels about anything, and it turns out that also includes how it feels pain. We as a nation of people feel pain differently state by state. At least that might be one thing you can pull from the conclusion of researchers from Texas A&M University and University of Pennsylvania who looked into opioid prescribing practices across the United States. Specifically, they collected data from around 100,000 outpatient knee surgeries nationwide. And then they looked at prescription rates and dosage of opioids in those prescriptions. What they found was a very wide ranging variability in, in both rates and to prescribing dosages. For instance, they found that prescription strength and number of tablets dosage prescribed uh, was highest in Oklahoma out of all 50 states and lowest in Vermont out of all 50 states. And Vermont was lowest in both number of pills and in dosage. And Oklahoma was highest in number of pills and in dosage. So very interesting. Uh, with Oklahomans being actually prescribed almost twice the number of tablets and more than twice the dosage or the uh, potency of those those pills. So uh, that's sort of so the uh, which could indicate that science, uh, since people are generally expected to have somewhat similar experiences uh, post surgery. Uh, and that uh, overprescribing can lead to addiction, that there's a need for a strong national guideline for prescribing opioids. That or uh, some parts of the country are just tougher than others, which it turns out Vermontans, Vermontonians, Vermontani, Vermonters, Vermonters, Vermonters. Vermonters, Vermonters. <laughs> turns out Vermonters are indeed the toughest people in the United States. Uh, and right. Oklahomans apparently are the weakest, which is kind of surprising because they get like 60 tornadoes a year. You would think that would toughen up a people going through that pain. And, uh, but no, maybe, yeah, maybe, um, maybe they're just hypersensitized. So Kiki, the, the map that you're sharing, I can't really see the, the, the key. So the what numbers. is the red and the gray and the blue? So gray is averages. That okay. means uh, based on what they were looking at, these, these these are states that had kind of the expected amount of prescribing rates uh, for these opioids. Uh, blue is lower. Blue is there was less being prescribed than what they the sort of expected average would be. And red is everything that's above. I see. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, according to the map. And so it's what you're saying is California is below Texas is below, New York is below. A lot of these large communities, these uh, high population states uh, seem to be on the low end. It's a lot of the rural map. It's a lot of the in-between. Uh, the only coastal looks like it's uh, one of the, like Washington and one of the, uh, I can't tell what that is. I don't know which state's well enough. Is that, a, is that a West Virginia? Is that what that is? That's in the red Which right one? On the East Coast. I can't see on the map. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But mostly it seems like the rural center, what you would call a flyover state, uh, are being prescribed at More. higher rates. Yes. Yeah, for the and so part. the question is, are these people weaker? Do they have lower pain tolerance throughout? Or is there perhaps some Over association happening? Just between, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But this yeah. is also a very specific subset, right? You said this is just people getting hip procedures? Knee, uh, these are outpatient oh, knee, knee procedures. surgeries. Yeah. So that's kind of a whole nother thing is that perhaps the reason people are getting prescribed things are different in different states yeah. too. That so, could be. you know, maybe Vermont isn't having as many knee surgeries. Maybe they're having way more hip surgery. 
You know, just well, I think there's there's something there. I understand it's within this this subset so, of knee. It's not just the number of surgeries, but I think it also it depends. Like, so for example, I just uh -huh. looked up the average age in these two states, and the average age in Vermont is forty three, and the average age in Oklahoma is thirty six. So, um, that so older be a people factor. older people have a higher pain tolerance. So maybe they've so been you, through more, right? Yeah. So if you go into the study, they started with much more than 100,000, but they narrowed down to what they uh, what they ultimately pulled was uh, people who were uh, naive, what is it, naive opioid users? Like this is like the first prescription that they're they're being given kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. like people who aren't already on pain medications for chronic anything, right? So that was one of the things they limited, people who were previous. And then they did some for... Uh, controlling for age and education and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I think, a correlation between education and dosage. So the more educated, the less likely uh, you might be to be prescribed mm, opioids at the higher rates. So interesting, but <clears throat> but part of that is the is the person doing the prescribing, right? Like, there's all this thing about how who prescribes opioids or over prescribes opioids target specific groups so that is also yep. part of this yeah there there's definitely going to be multiple factors that come in there's not going to be one easy answer so, for so, why but i'm yeah. going to guess that overall <laughs> there is over prescription happening yeah. but why that over prescription is happening may be different mm -hmm. in different places yeah so so that's i mean th i think that's also the point uh that they they make in this study is when you look at this Pain shouldn't vary that much. Right. From 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 Vermont to Oklahoma, it doubles in dosage. It doubles in number of pills for the same procedure. That shouldn't be right. That a statewide doubling. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not just it's it's not like they went to one one doctor or one hospital. This is the state average is double, which means some must be even more than that that are being prescribed for that to be the average, correct? Right? This is presumably mm -hmm. half of the prescriptions or even more than double. So that that, that speaks to a, a training or a problem or uh, potentially even like uh, somebody in the chat room is say, uh, suggesting maybe there's a pharma company who has a better sales team right. in that particular state or has more influence in that particular state. Or the, way, or the way, or the way the insurance by, by state for sure. Yep, yep, and uh, way, and people have different jobs and different reasons or different like yeah different different, different reasons jobs. that they need. They yeah, could so, have so jobs that are desk jobs. Room. Yeah, or maybe mm -hmm. they've got a job that's in a factory, or they've got a job in a warehouse or a coal mine, or you know who knows what the jobs are and jobs maybe are going to vary time. by state. Maybe, maybe you have a job time. that doesn't offer sick time. <laughs> So I think like, what we can get, get back. I think we, what we we can debate this, but I mean the bottom line is we don't know the answer for why mm -hmm. there is just a difference between states that is interesting. It deserves more study. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's talk about plants. Oh, I mean oh, dead bodies. Dead bodies. So first <laughs> comes stress, then comes pain, then comes death. So this is perfect. Yes. So, um, <laughs> Longtime listeners of the show will know that I'm obsessed with the body farm in Tennessee. Um, so this is U University of Tennessee's body farm. It's actually technically called the Anthropology Research Facility. <laughs> but it's where they put dead bodies and watch them in various states of decay in different situations. And they look at what it looks like, what decay looks like, but also more specifically, a lot of the time they look at what kind of biota grows on and in a body in different states of decay. So that then forensic scientists can go and they can, if they find a body in the woods, they can say, okay, based on the types of maggots in this body, uh, the shape that it's in, et cetera, this body is three weeks old, right? So then that helps with, uh, with all sorts of um, kind of the, the detective work on the other side, figuring out who the person is and what the circumstances around their death was and all that kind of stuff. So that's really helpful. Um, but for the first time now, 
uh, a new article in the journal Trends in Plant Science is looking at plants and their role in the decomposition of bodies as pertains to um, finding missing human remains. So that's the other side of this is that you can, if you see a lot of a particular kind of maggot in a particular area of a forest, you might say, ooh, something's dead around here. Mm -hmm. And that might help you find someone you're looking for. So this new kind of exploration is looking at how plants can help us find dead bodies. Normally when people go out searching for a body, they, if there's a lot of tree cover, it's pretty difficult. This is um, this is an area that you know you can't survey from a helicopter. Just doing a sweep, a blind sweep, is really you're going to have a difficult time finding a human. But you can utilize tree cover in body recovery missions to your advantage. They posit by detecting changes in plant chemistry as a signal of human remains. So in this journal article, they outlined the steps needed to make body recovery using vegetation something that we could do in the near future. Um, so they assessed, they're, they're planning on assessing how cadaver decomposition islands, which is the zone immediately surrounding a human that has died, changes the nutrient concentrations of soil yeah, and how those changes manifest in nearby plants. So the, one of the most obvious things is you have a huge release of nitrogen N into this. Lots soil, of, of nutrients in general. There's yeah. tons. Yeah. And so that can change uh, leaf color. It can change reflectance of leaves, which I think is very interesting. The, mm. the problem there is another large mammal like a deer dying in that yeah. area could have a yeah. similar impact. However, the next step of this is to see how specific metabolites like those from drugs or food preservatives, things that we eat that deer don't, might have a specific influence on plant appearance. So not just a dead oh. mammal, but a dead mammal that's been eating Twinkies. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, won't find, it won't find any vegans this way. Potentially. Uh -huh. So this is the other thing they said, is if they know anything about the specific person they're looking for, and they know, for example, that they're a heavy smoker. They could actually use a specific chemical profile that would trigger a specific plant response, and that would make them easier to locate. Wow. Wow. So this what? is still pretty far out, but this is what they're hoping to get to. So they're they're helping they're hoping to develop imagers to scan plants for fluorescence or reflectance via drone so that they could see like a chemical signature, like, hey, something dead is down there. And so um, this is just so cool. They think it's still a few years away from using plants as search tools and body recovery missions, but this is um, a collaborative effort of botanists, anthropologists, and soil scientists, and they are starting out at this body farm now. So good. Want to find a body? Ask a plant. Yes. Uh, speaking of plants, Alex uh, in the chat room is pointing out that... Uh, and it's great if you overlay the map of where uh, marijuana is legalized in the United States compared to where those opioids are being uh, prescribed, oh, yeah. it's pretty decent uh, match for what's where, where it's uh, illegal and where it's uh, still considered a recreational. So it's like medicinal. opposite? Is that what you're saying? Where, it kind of is, yeah. Where weed is illegal, the opioids, opioids are being getting... overprescribed. Interesting. It's sort of an, yeah. Like I can see the California doctor being like, "Hey, do you uh, you should maybe try the medical thing? It's a little easier to get off of than these opioids." Oh, okay, I might try that. Um, <laughs> oh, and uh, uh, Fada is also saying, uh, we, "No, that's not Fada. Who is saying this?" Uh, Kevin in the uh, YouTube chat room. I take it we should dump bodies in the water and not on land. Look, if you're trying to hide a body in the water, just a couple of things. First, bodies float. Yeah. Also, to, yeah. you have Correct. to remove you have to remove the shoes because. Uh, shoes will float, and the, eventually they. It's, it's okay. I'll do a little master class on how to hide a body at some other po uh, point. On there. Great, thanks, yeah, Justin. Yeah, sure record it and post awesome. it to YouTube. Yep, make sure you put it on YouTube. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all of us probably have a pair of blue jeans mm -hmm. in our closet, if not one, maybe a stack of them. Yeah, I've got several. I think. 
Your blue jeans aren't just in your closet. They're everywhere. What? Yeah. Researchers looking at uh, microfibers in the environment did sediment samples of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, the Laurentian Great, Great Lakes, and shallow suburban lakes in southern Ontario. And in looking for these wonder fibers, they found that 21 to 51 percent of all my microfibers in the sediments were from people, human modified cellulose. And of those, 40 to 57 percent of the microfibers they found were indigo denim microfibers. What? Yes. Over half uh, or about around half of the microfibers they found are from our genes. But I thought jeans were made out of cotton, so it was okay. It's cotton. They're microfibers. A lot of denim these days. Uh, it is cotton. Some of them use stretch fibers that yeah, uh, right. that come from um, more polymers, you know, bamboo, but that gets broken down and made into a plastic, and that's a stretchy, and then it's a polymer. And so some of these microfibers are not necessarily great, but what it gets at is... Not that the genes are bad necessarily, but they are an indicator of the pollution that are, we are spreading out into an environment. So they are what, in the words of the researchers publishing in uh, the Environmental Science Technology Letters, they said, uh, blue jeans, the world's single most popular garment, are an indicator of the widespread burden of anthropogenic pollution by adding significantly to the environmental accumulation of microfibers from temperate to Arctic regions. So this is a good time for me to let everyone know. So uh, I know that I'm usually the one who's saying shower, wash, shower, wash, but actually denim isn't really supposed to be washed very often. Nope. Um, so I think that's part of this too is, is, uh, you know, they were, denim was originally kind of invented to never, ever be washed. That be durable. The, yeah. So you're not really, you're supposed to like spot clean them if that. Um, and so, yeah, just a reminder that they don't need to be washed every week. Maybe like every few months, maybe just spot washing. I don't know. <laughs> but, but it is true. All of our, you might think that you're getting all of the, the, the lint out of your lint trap in the dryer. And those are all the fibers mm. that are, oh, are getting out there. But what's happening, and I think we've talked about it on the show before, is that little tiny fibers get into the wastewater from your laundry. And those fibers make their way out into the waterways and are very obviously getting distributed around the globe. So they're finding they're finding fibers from all your clothes out there. But hey, because jeans are the most prolific garment in the world, everyone loves jeans. Feel though in the chat are. room. Um, so that's why the ocean's blue. Yes, <laughs> ha, 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 yes. Ha. it's true. If you read if you read the ancient <laughs> Greek texts. The ocean used to be crimson. We completely changed. We went straight past purple into yeah. 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 So also thanks, Blue this, Jeans, this, for giving us a blue ocean. Okay, if anyone is a child listening to this, that is not how the yeah, the ocean. Oh, blue. it's not. No, okay. No. No. It's no. Very incorrect. Um, I just shared a link in the <laughs> chat room, but actually, one of the things that you can do to wash your jeans if you don't want to wash them and put microfibers in the in the world is you can actually freeze them. So you can put them in an airtight uh, freezer bag and put them in your freezer for a day and that'll kill the bacteria. I don't know the science behind this. I, just, I don't know if it'll kill blog, them. It'll just I don't actually kinda... know, but this is what someone with a lifestyle blog says. So we'll have to, I'll follow up. I'll follow up I next think, week. Yeah, we should test that. I don't know if that's accurate. Okay. Doesn't All sound... right. Doesn't but it right. sounds like fun, uh, especially when you put them on <laughs> first time. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh. 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 chili Ooh. jeans. Ah, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> cool your pants, man. All right, Justin, tell From me about the publications of the Astronomical Society of Australia. 
Tales of a Radio Telescope in Outback, Western Australia, which completed the deepest and broadest search at low frequencies for alien technologies. They scanned over 10 million stars. Wow. Chinua Tremblay and Professor Stephen Tingay used the Murchison uh, Widefield Array Telescope to explore hundreds of times more broadly than any previous search for extraterrestrial life. Tembley said the telescope was searching for technosignatures, powerful radio emissions at frequencies similar to FM radio frequencies that could indicate the presence of intelligent life in space. Uh, the Murchison, uh, I'm going to get this wrong every time. Murchison Wide Field Array is a unique telescope with extraordinary wide field of view that allows us to observe millions of stars simultaneously. She said, uh, that's uh, Dr. Tremblay. Uh, we observed the sky around the constellation of Bella for 17 hours, looking at looking uh, more than 100 times brighter and deeper than ever before. With this data set, we found no techno uh, signatures, no sign of intelligent life. Uh, Professor Tenge said that even though this was the broadest search yet, uh, he was not shocked by the result. As Douglas Adams noted in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, space is big, really big. And even, <laughs> though, even though this was a really big study, the amount of space uh, we looked at was the equivalent of trying to find something in one of Earth's oceans, but only searching in a volume of water equivalent to a large backyard swimming pool. We have to keep looking. So even with that 10 million stars looking for this signature, it, was just a very cursory uh, observation. So the there's a lot to look at. Yeah, there's a lot out there. So the current telescope is a precursor, as all of, all technology is, is a precursor for an instrument that is coming next, uh, which is the Square Kilometer or Square Kilometer Array (SKA), an observatory with telescopes that are in Western Australia as well as uh, Southern Africa. Due to increased sensitivity, SKA, Low Frequency Telescope, to be built in Western Australia, will be capable of detecting Earth-like radio signals from relatively nearby planetary systems, said Professor Tinge. With SKA, we'll be able to survey billions of star systems seeking technosignatures in an astronomical ocean of other worlds. Which I think Ooh. all aren't all other worlds uh, astronomical in nature, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah. So the next version of this coming is going to be able to really look at uh, like a lot more. <laughs> It'll get uh, us into Carl Sagan billions and billions of stars. Yeah, I mean, it should be able to. Uh, they're saying the new one's sensitive enough to pick up uh, like a FM uh, signal, like uh, from a planet, like if it was just a regular, like uh, even if it's not a very strong signal from a nearby planet. So it's uh, very, very cool that we're increasing this uh, this ability to look for life. But so far, goose eggs, nothing yet. Nothing. It's mm -hmm. not aliens out there yet. I don't want to Ghost find aliens thing. in 2020. We have to wait till we're out of 2020 to find aliens because something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there is. That's, right? that's a great point. Let's not of, find them this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, like they land and they're like, take me to your leader. And you're like, no, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. Uh, you, you, we're going to go hang out for like a meet few him. months. And then uh, yeah. or maybe you can give me a ride. We can go to somewhere else. And go, but I'm not taking you there. No way. Uh-uh. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, other ways that we are planning on looking at the universe is with a really big camera. And there is a camera under development currently that's being built at Stanford's Slack facility. It used to stand for the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerating Collider. I believe that's what the acronym stood for, but it does no longer because they're not colliding things in there anymore. But they do have a lot of amazing technology and what they are working on is a camera for the Vera Rubin Observatory that will produce images for the LSST, the Large, uh, large Synoptic Squared 
telescope. I don't know. Lots of acronyms in astrophysics, and I kind of forget every once in a while what all of them stand for. But it's going to be a really big distributed telescope that they are creating. And the Vera Rubin Observatory is the, the eye of this observatory with the camera. This camera has the equivalent of almost 216 megapixel smartphone cameras. Like if you took 216 megapixel cameras and you connected them all together and then took a picture with all of them together, that's what this camera is doing. It is 3.2 billion pixels. Megapixels, 3.2 billion megapixels oh, wow. in this image. It's a uh, massive, massive image. 3.2 billion pixels, 3,200 meg megapixels. That's what it is, 3,200 megapixels. I can do math. And the images that are coming out of it <laughs> so far during their testing are of vegetables. They've taken pictures of Romanesco broccoli. Wow. <laughs> so it's broccoli all the way down. It's broccoli all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they are connecting uh, what, around nine of these camera cameras together to make little segments that then get connected together. And all these things have to be connected together within like a hair's width of accuracy to be able to create the final image for the camera. This camera being tested in Stanford will eventually, now that they've tested it and shown it's perfect, it's wonderful, and they work out all the kinks for the images of broccoli, they will ship it down to Chile where the eventual observatory is going to be completed, which should give us amazing views of the universe. And they Maybe. should be able to spice up that broccoli really nicely in South America. I think so. Yeah. Broccoli. Nice spices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little lime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Why not broccoli? Why not? I guess you, why not? You know, you're going to take all sorts of pictures of the universe. Let's test it on vegetables. Uh, the uh, uh, it, this is Glenn Brady from the chat room saying interesting side note the SKA that uh, square kilometer uh, kilometer telescope when fully operational will transfer more data over the interwebs than the entire world today. You thought you had online gaming lag now? <laughs> there would be a lot of data. Yeah, it could be worse. Which is which is also the problem. Like we we can have this technology. Uh, to grab all this data, to take these high, high resolution images, but we still are working on the ability to decipher it once it's, to, to even manage that size of data, uh, to break it up, to have it even, uh, to have the power, the computing power to analyze it, uh, mm -hmm. let alone the human time and power to do so. Uh, we're, we're getting to, it's kind of awesome if you think about it, we're getting to uh, what is it, choke points or whatever, uh, where where our uh, ability to collect data has surpassed our ability to analyze it. To analyze is, it, yeah. Which and is sometimes uh, to view it. These images from um, the Vera Rubin cal uh, ca calendar camera, the observatory, will take. They require, if you look at them in full definition, the equivalent of 404K ultra high def TV displays yeah. <laughs> displayed <Yeah>. in full. <laughs> That's 3,200 megapixels. But it's a good problem to have. Uh, yeah, bottleneck. Well, because especially to... like since so... we're going to be stuck inside for the rest of our lives, some people will be able to analyze some data <laughs> sure. from their home, sure. which will be great. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, be great. But, That's not true. The, no, we but it's a great this. problem to have because. The opposite is like, we have all this ability to analyze, but we have no data. Like that would just suck. We've analyzed everything and we're just waiting for another pixel to drop to analyze that. This is the opposite problem. Uh, this is, we're going to be have stuff that we can take pictures and do investigations and then research it for decades uh, to come to find things. It's sort of like we're creating uh, what we've talked about quite a bit on the show is that basement in the university or in the museum where all the fossils are stored. And people are, you know, 
5, 10, 20, 80 years later, still making discoveries in these basements with this collected data. Uh, we're starting to do that with our, our telescopes now, which is really an amazing, fun time. So many discoveries to make. This is This Week in Science. We are here. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in one of our shirts, mugs, hats, face masks, head over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle link and browse our store. Lots of items and ways that you can support Twist. Okay, time for our COVID update. Do 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 do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> We're still at over a thousand deaths in the United States per week or per day. There's a lot. It's bad. It's not great. But let's talk about risk. Okay, everybody, let's talk about risk today. An interview, some tapes of Trump talking to Bob Woodbert, Woodward, a, uh, a journalist, have Trump saying, just today and yesterday, some startling facts came out. It's not just old, older, young people too. Plenty of young people. That's what Trump told Woodward on March 19th. March 19th, at the beginning of this pandemic. Whoops. And in the mean, meanwhile, over several months, it has been a constant message as to how little young, young adults have to be concerned about this pandemic and getting this virus. Well, there is uh, one of the Th there's a research letter that was published this week in the journal JAMA, Internal Medicine, showing that young adults can experience substantial rates of adverse outcomes. Yes, they may not uh, become as sick as individuals, uh, as older individuals as often, but an analysis of 3,222 young adults between 18 to 34 years old hospitalized with COVID-19 indicated that 21% required intensive care, 10% required mechanical ventilation, and 2.7% died. The researchers want people to know that young adults should know that everyone, regardless of age, is at some risk of a severe outcome from COVID. So just to know, just to know, take it seriously. Uh, you know, you may be safe, but you may also... Uh, transmit it to somebody else who may not be. Obesity, according to the first meta-analysis of its kind, is a major risk for COVID-19 and for uh, hospitalization and uh, problems with the disease. In the journal Obesity Reviews, an international team of researchers pooled data from scores of peer-reviewed papers capturing 399,000 patients. So this mm -hmm. isn't a little study. They're, they're pooling things together. It's observational. Mm -hmm. This is probably not a random controlled trial, but this is nearly 400,000 people they're looking at. Mm -hmm. They found that people with obesity who contracted SARS-CoV-2 were 113% more likely than people of healthy weight to land in the hospital, 74% 70, more likely to be admitted to an ICU, and 48% more likely to die. That's from uh, Science Magazine's news. So there are, there are things that predispose people to higher risk. Um, and the it's not necessarily obesity itself that pre predisposes people. Uh, in the uh, the article, they discuss BMI very often. So very high BMIs seem to be the thing that leads to these in an increased risk of hospitalization, more likely to be admitted to a high C ICU and to die. Um, but it is. Factors that go along with that, like obesity, increases inflammation. And inflammation is something that is a huge part of how SARS-CoV-2 affects the body. So if you're already 
struggling with inflammation, that's going to have a deleterious effect. It also leads to um, a thickening of the blood and a change in the blood cells themselves, which is a problem very often when people are obese and blood doesn't move as easily or if there's uh, there is an issue with circulation. Um, so it's not necessarily obesity itself because a high BMI on its own does not necessarily indicate obesity because there are many people mm -hmm. who have just, you are tall, you are big, yeah. you are muscular. BMI, BMI is kind of nothing. It, yeah, it's a, vague, it's a vague measure, but they're using yeah. it because they don't have a better one at this point. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to make this this distinction that there are other health factors that are involved in it, um, in changing the way that your metabolism works. So, um, just be I mean, careful out there. Makes you more susceptible to other things too. Yes. So it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now that we know that it's a blood disease, that, that makes even more sense. So. Yep. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to talk about for the, the COVID, the COVID corner. Over well, there's here. more news though. There are more. There are more. There, uh, there's factors. more. There's more. Just wait. Factors. There's more. Yeah, this is a leader of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Kiev, Ukraine, spoke up about COVID crisis back in March, calling it God's punishment for the sins of men and sinfulness of humanity. A a but he didn't stop there. He he clarified. He did clarify. First of all, I mean same-sex marriage. This is the cause of coronavirus. So well, please tell me he got COVID, not to be mean, but. So, of course. What is this schadenfreude? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, of course, of course, he has contracted COVID-19 and through the very real and effective uh, power of prayer alone has remained in stable condition at a Ukrainian hospital. Uh, the COVID illness comes as a great shock to the congregation who had no idea the patriarch was secretly married to a man. Right. In the uh, Sturgis <laughs> motorcycle rally, uh, in one of the Dakotas, perhaps, uh, they drew a crowd of nearly half a million maskless bikers <laughs> in the height of the pandemic. A uh, new paper uh, titled The Contagion Externality of Super Spreading Event, the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in COVID-19. Published by ISA, which is the Institute of Labor Economics, which is a German think tank. Uh, they conclude that the rally was indeed a super spreader event that transmitted the virus thousands upon thousands of times. One of the authors of the paper, Joseph J. Sabia, who's also a professor of economics and director of the Center of Health Economics and Policy Studies at San Diego State University, thinks the event could have infected more than 260,000 people all across the country. Talk about super uh, spreading. Yeah, he, he and his co-authors estimate that dealing with the fallout from that rally alone would involve more than $12 billion in healthcare costs, again, spread out across the United States. Governor Christy Lynn Noam, uh, of whatever Dakota that might have been, was so concerned about the safety ahead of the rally that she told Fox News, we hope people come. Our economy benefits when people come and visit us. The uh, particular Dakota, I guess it was the South one. Now it's been clarified. So a 35% rise in cases post rally. Counties wow. and other states from which significant number of residents traveled to Sturgis saw an average of a 10.7% increase. That's substantial. That's, I mean, <laughs> that's not nothing. And that no. lady got COVID, right? Uh, no, not yet. But, uh, but, so, but uh, I don't but, want anyone to get COVID, but the people who think it's nothing, it well, just feels here's, appropriate. That's all I'm saying. So, so here's the, I don't here's want the, anyone to get it. Come on. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. A half a million people. Uh, I mean, I get like nobody's expecting bikers to be the most responsible citizens amongst us. I think uh, maybe on the road. They followed the road rules very well. They do a great job with that. Uh, 
but but that large of a crowd is coming from across the country and then going back out into the. Uh, I don't know that anybody should be surprised by that uh, <laughs> People, <laughs> fallout from the event. And and I do have to have to add the observation that I've seen people talking about, well, I haven't heard anything about cases rising because of protests or I haven't heard anything because of, so, you know, so, compared so, compared yeah. to Sturgis. And so I think that we right. need to make this point here so, about so indoors versus outdoors and mask wearing. Right. So actually, this uh, same think tank had looked at exactly what you're talking about previously. They had previously looked at uh, were the mass protest super spreader events and be, for exactly what you just stated, the fact that they were outdoors, that there was uh, some uh, social distancing at a lot of them, uh, but that uh, people were all wearing masks. Uh, the vast majority of you look at those people. Uh, I could just say majority. It doesn't have to be vast. There's no difference between saying the word vast ahead of a majority any more than there is saying vast in front of wasteland. They mean the exact same thing. Uh <laughs> People were wearing masks. And so those two combination of things, uh, what prevented those from being, there was no evidence of super spreader events from the protests. Because of that, in Sturgis, they were not wearing masks. They were not social distancing. And on top of everything, they were having fun. <laughs> no, no fun that, having any that's the, thing that, that, that's the thing the pandemic <laughs> likes least of all is that if fun. you were enjoying something, it's wrong. <laughs> that's how you can tell at this point. <laughs> no, it's because they were going indoors to restaurants, bars, cafes in Sturgis and yeah. congregating indoors. Yeah. <sighs> oh, what a week of news. What a week of news. Did you have one, uh, one more oh, story? Yeah, you uh, that's there? right. It's uh, uh, so this is this is on the serious note. Uh, there's another group that was looking at who is doing this. It's a group of researchers from Syracuse University. Uh, they were looking at the average daily increase in rural COVID nineteen mortality rates. This is people dying, and they found significantly higher uh, rates of death in rural Black and Hispanic. Uh, Community. So, we people tend to think of rural America is uh, being just full of uh, toothless white people. <laughs> people have good dental everywhere now. Thank you. Uh, but it's actually twenty percent of our racial ethnic minorities are in rural areas geographically. Uh, and what it was is uh, compared to rural counties with the lowest black populations. This is the bottom quartile. Uh, rural counties in the top quartile uh, of percent black have a 70% higher daily increase in their COVID-19 mortality rates. Uh, and, and the same thing applying it uh, to Hispanic populations, ones with the lowest versus ones with the highest. The one uh, Hispanic rural uh, areas have a 50% higher average daily increase in their mortality rates. So the research team is not exactly saying what the problem is, uh, but is suggesting that we need to pay a lot more attention to the way healthcare is being distributed in America. And that there seems to be, they're not saying it, but I will, a systemically racist sort of seemingly application to the way that we deal with us and who we see as us yeah. from political, governmental spending, where those dollars go. Uh, and how the prevention has been or not been uh, taking place. Yep, I think that is, that, you, I mean, that's... Gail Sater is saying even people in Britain have good dental. Is that true? I thought that was one of the things that they were just it's never going to it's do. It's nationalized, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I know they have health care, but does that include their dental too? Because I, I don't know. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have to go, so, to the dentist. Yeah. All right. That does it for our COVID update. This is This Week in Science. Whoop, do, 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 do. You want to help Twist grow? Get a friend to subscribe today. That would be fantastic Rooney <laughs> or something. <laughs> 
Hey Blair. Yeah. Hey Blair. Hey Blair. I think it's that time of the show yes. that we love to call Blair's Animal Corner. It's your turn now. Let's hear it from Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. By a pet, little pet, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm no Oh, Justin's not here to say it. Say it, Kiki. I can't oh. start. What you, what you got, Blair? There we go. I can't start <laughs> I without it. The same way. Where'd he go? <laughs> um, hey, so I have a lovely story about one of our favorites, naked mole rats. So this is a study from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we've already discovered that naked mole rats can survive acid and live where there's low oxygen content and survive cancer and all this other crazy stuff. But in a new twist, um, something they're actually really terrible at is hearing. Oh, really? <laughs> they, they have terrible, terrible, terrible hearing. So they're from East Africa. They're hairless mammals. They're bald. They're wrinkly. They have buck teeth. If you have not seen them, search naked mole rat. You have to search naked mole rat because mole rats are also a thing. It's a different they, thing. They just, they look, they just, they just look like little furry things with giant teeth but they don't look furry are, 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 no normal oh, naked ones yes are furry yeah so these guys are not furry they live underground they live in this crazy society that's kind of like a bee society they have soldiers they have workers they have a queen they use chemical signals to know who's coming where when and what their social rank is and the higher ranked individual climbs over the lower ranked individual in the tubes and or in the underground i can talk about it forever but <laughs> this study <laughs> is about um their communication because the, it, most of the communication they do is vocal so as I mentioned, they use chemical cues too, but they do a lot of squeaking at each other to decide where to dig, how to defend the colony, how to convey the location of food, how to take care of babies. They're constantly chirping and squeaking. But if, they've, if they have terrible hearing, what the heck is going on here? Um, so this new research found that they had hearing that was so terrible, and then they used technology uh, like used for uh, human hearing. So they performed an auditory brain stem response test. They had electrodes on the scalp that pick up signals that indicate sound being processed by the brain. And the signals were so weak. They have poor hearing. They have hearing so bad that in humans, hearing on that level would be suggested to wear hearing aids. So, yeah. <laughs> so they so need then, hearing aids. Okay. Right. So they're animals that communicate via auditory response and they have terrible hearing. So why is this happening? So then they looked at the genes. They found six mutations in genes associated specifically with hearing loss in humans. So they have mutation. They have six independent mutations showing, like pushing them towards bad hearing. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they're actually being selected for. And they're, that they're adaptive, they're beneficial in some way to, ha to have this hearing loss. Additionally, they found what out- What else do the genes do? That's what I want to know. Okay. Yeah, that's, know. Okay. that's a great question. I do not know. But they okay, also found out that the naked mole rats do not have cochlear amplification, which is for, for you know, humans that don't have the little hair cells in the inner ear, um, or cochlear amplification abilities. People now can get implants to help them do that and hear, and they pretty much can't hear without it. So um, cochlear amplification is pretty essential in human hearing. So they have these inner ear kind of hair cells and um, they send signals to the brain. And um, without these cells, hearing's really hard. And this is why like hearing loss in, hu in humans is kind of, it degrades over time. It's progressive. I've been to a lot of rock concerts. My hearing's harder and harder. It's because loud s sounds actually kill hair cells. So they can't regenerate. Um, but these guys, they don't even have them at all. <laughs> so what the heck is happening here? They actually found that 
the decibel level of these chirps and squeaks that these mole rats are using to communicate with each other are so loud underground huh. that if they had functional cochlear amplification, yeah. They would be lethal to the hair cells. They'd lose all their hearing yeah, anyway. That makes sense. So this is the first thing I was wow. thinking is like, yeah, if they all have squeaky voices, maybe they're just trying to tune each other out. Yes. So, so, so they don't have my, amplification because they really don't need it. But okay, right. but here's the question then. What they're always at a rock first? concert. But yeah. what came first? Like, did they Great start question. did they have to start shouting louder and louder because nobody could hear them? Right. And so they developed a, a louder squeak over time because nobody could hear them if they just talked in their indoor voice. So that's possible. Or the but other I way. I feel like that it, the only way that would make sense is if, as Kiki mentioned, these genes are linked to something else. Because otherwise, why would you get six specific mutations mm -hmm. to impact hearing before? Yeah, I, well, but, but, we, we so... so so, so here's here's my here's the here's the what I'm pulling from. I have this uh, cousin who I noticed at a very young age as we were growing up was just so much louder than the rest of us. And I'm I'm loud. I have a loud family. We're all loud. She was a decibel or ten above the everybody else when she talked all the time. It was just her indoor voice was shouting across a very very long distance. Um, and it turned out she had some hearing issues. So, so that's kind of what I, I would pull from. And I'm thinking like, wow, maybe it was, maybe it was just the fact that their hearing was, you know, through some random uh, mutation that these were like failing genes. And then, and then it starts the like, yeah. And then, and then those who hadn't experienced this yet, perhaps, uh, had their, they were just killing it off anyway. So why spend the energy growing these dang hair follicles if everyone else is yelling all the time? So I think here's what we need to do. Um, excuse me, uh, University of Illinois. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh, oh, oh. Um, it would be great to do these studies on non-naked mole rats, just normal mm -hmm. reg mole rats, a ridge mole rats, and then on other rodents. And to see if there's anything indicative in the genome that any relative mm -hmm. would have any similar mutations or anything leading towards that, but also to check the decibel level of the squeaks of those other animals. Because for example, yeah. normal mm -hmm. mole rats, they go to the surface sometimes. These guys don't really. So they go to the surface of a fair amount more. And so they might use i don't know a lot about mole rats but they might use alarm calls so they might be re they might or be they might of it, really loud noise or they might also be since they're going to the surface listening for predator calls so so there so might be a clue be in the chat room uh i don't don't know if it's true but timid tenor uh says i remember hearing something about moles using squeaks to freak out worms the worms scoot to the surface trying to run away from the loud squeaks. I don't know if this is naked mole rats, uh, but but this is no, that would be not just moles. moles. Yeah. 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 But that would be a kind of funny that like you used it to get your prey and then it affected your uh your own ability to hear. That would be kind of a yeah. Uh, that would be a catalyst. You know, so, you need to do yeah. this to eat would be a uh, an interesting evolutionary catalyst for the loss of the hearing then. And I, I think that's why doing a, a comprehensive look at decibel levels across rodents and then additionally mm -hmm. looking at the these genes and seeing if there's yeah. anything, any artifacts, anything similar in any other genomes, that would kind of tell us which came first. But mm -hmm. it seems like I would guess these guys moved underground. <laughs> Everything's really, the sound is super insulated now. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're pretty much 100% of the time underground, super mm -hmm. insulated. That makes it super loud. But why and, wouldn't they just start whispering? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Use your indoor voice. That's Use your underground question. voice. Why are they, but why maybe are they, they whispering? Do, how far do they travel from each other? How far do those calls have to go? I mean, there are all sorts of yeah, things yeah, that need to be yeah. asked here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do believe. Yeah. So anyway, point being, um, based on all of this research, they actually think that mole rats might be a good animal model to investigate hearing loss in humans. Because still, some of the genes 
that are similar. They're, they're the same genes uh, related to hearing loss in humans, one. And two, that this loss of the uh, inner ear hairs is, is a problem that humans have. So you could potentially look into treatment through the naked mole rats. Uh, a quick poll right. popped up in the chat room. Uh, Caroline Benoit uh, is asking, uh, group poll, if you had to choose between uh, your hearing and vision, which would you choose? That is tough. That's a tough uh, one. So because I love this show so much, mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably hearing. say hearing because then I could listen to the show. But then it would be really hard to, to prepare the show. So then I don't know. <laughs> so you have to get a really good um, speech to text software. You'd be I have that, but I still have to highlight the text, which is still the problem. right. But if you were if you were hearing impaired, you'd have tools. You know what? I think I would probably uh, yes, yes. It's you know that's a really tough one. I think it might it, I might have to let the oh yeah ouch I don't know. Yeah, Goldazator, no, that want... is very rude. Does Blair's vision count as having vision? <laughs> Listen, I might be nearsighted. I might have a terrible astigmatism. I might also be colorblind, but come on now. <laughs> I can see some things when I wear my contacts. He can I see can some of them. Anyway. All right. What's your next story, Blair? Oh, just a, a really revolutionary study telling oh. us that. Um, this is from University of Queensland telling us that if we have protected areas, uh, it helps save endangered species. What? <laughs> Interesting. Mind blown. No, there's a reason this is actually an important study. So um, we know that we have set aside protected areas in the wild to help animals uh, not have as much pressure from human development and hunting and all these other things. And that they're essential to conservation. But despite this intuitively making sense and the success to this point with those areas, they their popularity as a go-to conservation tool comes and goes. And right now it actually looks like it's starting to wane. Um, so there's this increasing debate around global protected areas and whether it actually helps with threatened species. And I, I think actually we did a study, I think not too long ago, who knows, maybe it was three years ago, but we did a study on the show where they, they looked at protected areas. And as would make sense, if you have a protected area that is small, that is not connected to other protected areas, it doesn't do diddly. <laughs> Because you can't tell a rhino, just stay, just stay over here in this half egg. Just stay over. Don't go yeah. over there. <laughs> so yeah. that is part of the problem. And so I think there's there's some debate over how best to do this. But we also know that Blair likes to orate about how you can't save species, you can only save habitats. And those habitats save all the species that depend on it. You can't say, I want to save rhinos and just save the rhinos. Really, the only way to save the rhinos is to save the space, their habitat that they depend on. And the, the positive there is all the other animals that use that space also get a place to, to be saved. So saving habitats is key to species conservation. But they have to be well-funded, they have to be protected, and they have to be well-placed and they have to be big. So these are all like very big caveats, right? But um, this study looked at the efficacy of these areas and, and found that they are in fact very effective overall. So 80% of mammal species that were monitored in protected areas in this study have at least doubled their coverage in those protected areas over the last 50 years. So their time spent in those areas has doubled. So that means it's helping. They are choosing to spend time in those protected areas. And 10% mm -hmm. of those species <laughs> that they analyzed lived predominantly on that land. That was their main space. So yes, they're very smart. They figured out where it's easier to live. And in the, these cases, it's easier to live in those protected areas. They looked at 237 threatened terrestrial mammal species from the 1970s today. They measured changes in species ranges and overlaid them with protected area work. 
And specifically, they did, as I mentioned, they looked at greater one-horned rhinos, rhinoceros unicornis. So good. Is Which it now, really? Yes, it is. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Which is now, uh, it, it, 80% of its range is now in a protected area. So um, that's something, you know, it's, it's working is basically the point. So without protected yeah. areas, some species like rhinos, like tigers, like mountain gorillas, they wouldn't have stood a chance. And so we gave them a space to hide out, to feel safe, to lower their guard. <laughs> These are all important things, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so if you can recognize that, and, you know, instead of saying that these two studies, that the study I mentioned previous, that are on opposite sides of this argument, they're not. They're actually both contributing to information that could help save species. We need better funded protected areas. We need more protected areas. And most importantly, we need corridors between them. Yeah. Which is really the thing. So then is they if, can move around. Right. If we know that yeah. animals are choosing the protected area, that's great news. That means if we put a corridor between two, they're not going to walk higgledy piggledy all over the place. If they recognize that as a protected space over time, they will choose that corridor. So that yeah, it's possibly. good news. Possibly. Uh, the, the first reaction I have to this is, uh, those are the protected areas. And so the animals that are staying in those protected areas might be uh, the less wandery uh, inclined because the animals that were more likely to wander have long since been killed because they left a protected area. And it made me immediately think like uh, in, a, in a decade's yep. time as this pandemic uh, progresses, it could be we're left with a planet full of introverts uh, and that the, all the extroverted people who like to go out and socialize and just can't help themselves all get, all get felled by the virus. Uh, yeah. because, I mean, but it made me sort of think like maybe, you know, maybe the animals that are just like less explorative in nature are the ones that ha are still left there. Good. They'll survive they, humans. They'll yeah, survive they, the humans. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it makes me wonder, though, if the corridor thing uh would really if they would really take advantage of this uh versus so it does uh, just work. staying I mean, where they is, are still this it's is something that's currently work. in yeah. practice yeah so like right. in south america they have these uh poles with a wire over them that go over freeways so that monkeys and sloths can cross above a freeway and not get hit by a car in okay. uh in california we have salamander tunnels that go under highway 101 that the salamanders use so animals will avoid the dangerous humans, if they can, if they're given the opportunity, m most of the time they want nothing to do with us. So we're we're yep. binocular vision, bipedal, scary stuff. Stay away. So, and we have cars and weapons yeah. and things and yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, anyway, this is just this is showing us that we're doing good work here. The focus on habitats and protected areas is working, and this is important science because. This is the science side of conservation, right? Making sure it's actually working. Instead and of I think putting the, money into things. And stuff. It's one of those yeah, things and, that bears and checking that it's really too. And checking that it's really working because the thing that stands out to me is that so many of these species have lost more than 50% of their range since the 1970s. So this is all they've got left. And so we need p protected ranges to work. We need something to work if we want to conserve them. Yeah, so, you know, make sure that they don't get put a pipeline through it or new development on top or no. keep them is basically no, what we're let's keep, keep them. them. We need more, actually. So, and that more. goes to marine protected areas and stuff, too. All of it. We more. We don't go. <laughs> <laughs> this is This Week in Science. If you're just tuning in, we just finished Blair's Animal Corner and we've got a little bit more science to come. Thank you for listening to This Week in Science. Really appreciate the fact that you're here with us this week. And, you know, every week we bring you this show. We try to bring you good science and good conversation around the science, try and delve into issues with curiosity and spark your own curiosity. And it's with your support that we can really do this. 
With your support, we're able to keep bringing you twists week after week. And if you're interested in helping continue to support twists and keep us going, head over to twist.org, click on our Patreon link, and choose your level of support. $10 and up per month. And we'll thank you by name at the end of the show, if that's what you'd like. Be a part of sharing science and maybe a more sane perspective with the world. Thank you for your support. We really can't do it without you. A and fish out of water. We're back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we're back with more of this week in science. Yeah, I was right? waiting for you to do it. Is it going uh, to do it? I didn't no? do it. Uh, a fish out of water is a floppy, gasping mess of a creature. Uh, unless, unless you're perhaps, a lung fish. A mud skipper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple exceptions to this rule. Another being the blind cave fish, Cryptotora thamicola, also known as the cave angel fish, uh, which is of the loach species, which lives in caves. This one uh, with fast moving water can be found climbing cave walls at times, going from one place to the other. Uh, and a new study research analyzed the bone structure of this and nearly 30 other hill stream loach species fish, describing for the first time three categories of pelvic shapes. Based on the shape of, shape of the bone that connects some loach's spines to the pelvic fins, the team found that there's 10 other species of the loach that shared the cave angel uh, fish's unusually hefty pelvic girdle. This is Quoty Voice from biologist Zachary Randall. Fishes don't usually have any connection between their spine and pelvic fin. Uh, but before, uh, uh, so before the idea was that the cave angel fish was totally unique. So it developed this, uh, this, this girdle of a uh, pelvic bone on its own. What's really cool about this paper is it shows with high detail that robust pelvic girdles are more common than we thought in the hillstream loach family. Meaning that uh, when this uh, blind cave fish ended up in this cave, uh, it was maybe pulling from... Uh, and a previous adaptation uh, that allows this, this species to adapt to something like this environment. Uh, it says that though more than 100 species of hillstream loach are found throughout Southeast Asia, the cave range fish is the only one whose walking capabilities have been observed and studied. It has a salamander-like wiggle powered by enlarged ribs bolstered with stabilizing muscle attachments uh, on its fins, which are uh, were first described in scientific reports just in 2016. Randall says the cave angel fish's walk is a key adaptation for surviving fast flowing cave streams. It can grip rocky stream beds and move between habitats, even up waterfalls as water levels fluctuate in the dry season. Cable, uh, cave angel fish's increased mobility can help it access well oxygenated stream regions with fewer no occupants. Still, little is known about the species, including what it eats. And this is also <laughs> something very fascinating. It's a blind fish, so it doesn't have vision uh, to so find prey. So has a climber. Prey. Doesn't know where it's going. <laughs> well, it doesn't have vision to find prey. So usually, when that happens, those fish are using some sort of chemical signatures in the water to track prey. Because they're living in these fast-moving streams where water's constantly going past. In the dark. Is, in the dark. They don't also have what would normally be considered like this pool where these chemical signatures are allowing them to track down prey. So not only do they not know what this thing eats, they have no idea how it would find anything to eat. <laughs> it's missing. <laughs> it's missing all of those things that they assume uh, are found in the past allow fish to find blind fish to find prey. So uh, blind or fish that live in very low light environments even. So having the combination of no sight and fast moving water, this is a very confusing fish uh, and it can come out of the water. So this is, this is uh, but yeah, it says they convert. Uh, this is a lead author, uh, PhD candidate, Callie Crawford. These loaches have converged on a structural requirement to support terrestrial walking that's not seen in other fish. The relationship among these fishes suggests that the ability to adapt to fast flowing rivers may be what has been passed on genetically over time. So 
Yeah, it's a a a, a huge mystery fish. <laughs> a big mystery. It's a, yeah, it's a very uh, so uh, Randall and his team most recently observed the cage angel fish on a 2019 cave excursion in Northwest Thailand. Uh, they were and they were surprised because it's so rare. They found six of them clinging to the bed of a fast flowing shallow stream uh, among glittering stalagmites in one of the cave's chambers. Okay, so listen. <laughs> Amphibians came from a, a fish ancestor. Right. So in the hundreds of millions of years since that occurred, uh, nobody else tried it, really? <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm not getting. Is like, especially considering amphibians can't go everywhere fish can go necessarily. Um, there are unutilized niches mm. that would require getting out of the water. Mm. It's I, it's it's crazy to me because like fish out of water, that's the whole thing. Fish are fish and amphibians are amphibians and fish don't go on land and fish don't walk and all this kind of stuff. But also, but that's where they came from. Yeah. So <laughs> just, you well, know. I mean, we have like uh, the what is it? The mud skipper is uh, an mm -hmm. insane creature. It has like a water lung, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Like it does the opposite of what you do when you go underwater swimming. When you take a big gulp of oxygen and you go under the water, it takes a big gulp of water and then comes out of the water and can sustain itself for for a time yeah. before having to go back and refresh. So there are strategies uh, that yes, absolutely mimic. Uh, different progressions out. I like the fact that they described its waddle, though, like you say, like like a salamander, uh, as it's living underground. It's it's found a similar uh, motility to something that's been very successful at it. It's because of their pelvis. The pelvis connection. It's, the same. it's either the, it's the wiggle in the walk or the giggle yeah. in the talk. Oh my goodness! You got it. That's a more uh, right. Is that no? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> No, Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Missing Link. Missing Link has been found between modern day Gibbons and its ancient uh, ancestor. Uh, has been, this has been found in India, which is sort of interesting because uh, Gibbons uh, in Africa are thought to have originated in Asia, I suppose. Maybe it's the other way around. Uh, I guess it would be the other way around. But they found this one in India in the, like sort of the halfway point. Or, well, that is Asia, I guess it is, isn't it? Hasn't always been. Anyway, this 13 million year old fossil is from an entirely new undiscovered ape, which is now the earliest ancestor of the modern day given. Uh, the discovery by Christopher C. Gilbert from Hunter College fills, according to this, a major void in the ape fossil record and provides new evidence about when ancestors of Tate Gibbons migrated to Asia from Africa. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, this fossil isn't much. It's not much. It's just a tooth. That's all they have. It's a okay. complete, it's a lower molar. Not much to talk about, except there is. Well, there's a lot to talk about just based on this one tooth. It, it, it belongs to a completely uh, unknown genus of, and species, which they named Capi Ramnagarensis. Uh, this is a, a first new ape fossil, fossil of a new ape found, discovered in the, uh, what is a pretty famous fossil site at Ramnagar in India in nearly a hundred years. So they found lots of, they've identified lots of ancient apes, uh, lots of species from here, but this is the first one in a hundred years. And it's the first Gibbon ancestor. Uh, Gilbert and team members were climbing a small hill in an area where a fossil primate jaw had been found the year before. While pausing for a short rest, Gilbert spotted something shiny in a small pile of dirt on the ground. So we dug it out and quickly realized he'd found something special. Quotey voice, we knew immediately it was a primate tooth, but it did not look like the tooth of any of the primates previously found in the area. From the shape and size of the molar, our initial guess was that it might be from a gibbon ancestor. But that seemed too good to be true, given that the fossil record of lesser apes is virtually non-existent. There are other primate species known during that time, and no gibbon fossils have previously been found anywhere in Ramnagar. So we knew we would have to do our homework, 
<clears throat> to figure out exactly what this little fossil was. And so this is this discovery of this fossil was in 2015. So it's been five years of study and analysis and comparisons that's been conducted for them to finally come to the ultimate conclusion that their first guess was correct. <laughs> it is a given ancestor. I mean, I guess it takes five years to build an entire animal out of a tooth. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see. So, yeah. So, there it is. Ancestor of the gibbon. Ben. This is uh, published in the Proceedings of the Royal <laughs> Society B, if you have an interest in pursuing it. I love but, uh, science that, that of uh, science like this where it's, it's a tooth and they can identify because of the shape of the tooth, ridges on the tooth, aspects of the tooth, the morphology of it. Okay, this is a gibbon, but this isn't a modern gibbon. This is an old gibbon. This is a gibbon that we've never seen. I mean, the idea that they can put all of the things together mm -hmm. is, I mean, the, the, the scientific forensics at play are, are astounding. Yeah. So this, and this is also sort of, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's also showing a migration of apes into Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, clarifying. So, so there are uh, gibbons and orangutans in Southeast Asia. But this is they, and they found in orangutan ancestors, I suppose, in this area as uh, previously. But so now this is sort of at the same time, they're also now finding gibbons, uh, a, the first example of a gibbon in this area. So they can sort of see that they all were transitioning together, uh, that this it wasn't just the green tanks from here and then somehow you know, uh, a gibbon ended up there much later. They're showing it's sort of a, a natural radiation uh, that took place. Uh, yeah. Radiation is good. I mean, not when you're in outer space, but you know, radiation leads leads to mutation. Mutation yeah. is good. Yeah, mutation is great. Mutation maybe leads to genetic change and the change in your abilities. I've got some stories about abilities. One of them is an ability that I do not have. I don't have the ability to break down lactose. Mm. Mm. You would think with my incredibly Northern European heritage that that would be something I would have inherited. But no, I'm one of the few from the North <laughs> who did not get the particular genes involved in uh, digesting lactase, which is the sugar in milk. Well, a team from Stony Brook University, they looked at some bones from Bronze Age skeletons from uh, a battle that took place around 1200 BC. Their findings looking at these bones and the genes in the bones that indicate lactase persistence and the spread of the ability to digest lactase are published this week in Current Biology. Nobody, like really, humans are kind of special because we can drink milk as adults, or at least there's a subset of our population who can. And that's not always been the case. And at one point in time, we did not have the genes to digest milk, but then farming spread through Northern Europe and people started drinking goat milk, cow milk, milk all the milks, and not just in childhood, but into adulthood to get nutrition. And so there was a spread of lactase persistence as a result of this spread in farming. But they thought it took place over like several thousand years, and they looked at this particular pile of bones. They had soldiers, probably about 4,000 warriors uh, from this battle on the banks of Tolens in Germany. And it's a really big battle that occurred in the Bronze Age. A quarter of those 4,000 warriors probably died. So these bones are like 3,000 years old. They got the DNA and the researchers looked into them and found that huh, most of them did not have genes 
for lactase persistence. So that means that if you look at the gene bank from 2,000 years later in the medieval period, 70 to 90% of people in the uh, in Central European countries had the ability to drink milk. And so, so it, do you over, think it's... So basically it went from like n nobody, one in eight warriors had the, the genetic variant to almost everybody, over 60% of adults able to drink milk. So is this going to be mutation or is this going to be natural selection? I mean, is it going to be that if you couldn't handle the new uh, high energy food source that was uh, showing up in these uh, agricultural villages, are you going to be more sickly, less likely to like, who's going to want to marry you if you're flatulent every time you simply have. But that's part of it. And so the researchers think that the only way that this would have spread so quickly in a matter of 2000 years from almost nobody to almost everybody, that in 2000 years, that it had to have been positive selection. So a case of the genes for lactase persistence positively affecting survival in some way. They don't know exactly what that means, but it could be that maybe uh, parents who did have the genes were gaining enough nutrition to be able to have stronger offspring who were able to survive better. Maybe there was some nutritional benefit or uh, a benefit that uh, you know kept their immune systems stronger? You know, was it something that something allowed them to survive better? And that's what they think happened. They, they don't think that there would be any other real explanation other than yeah. something tied to a positive selection drive during that time period that would make it happen so quickly. Yeah, and it, it's something else to, to, to keep in mind whenever we're talking about the ancient past. Like, whenever you see these uh, movies, uh, you know, the, the 300... Uh, you know, the, the Spartans, the, the these warriors, these Vikings, these whatever shows, they show these very big, strong, muscular people going to battle. So to be a superior specimen of uh, physicality in the old world basically just meant that you weren't malnourished. Because most right. people, most yeah. people had sure. horrible diets that couldn't sustain muscle building. Like they, nobody was lifting weights in the old world. That was ridiculous. So when they talk about these heroes, that, they weren't giants. They weren't super muscular, strong, fit people, right? These were just people who had had, you know, drink milk occasionally. And we're like, had, maybe you know, got to eat some meat. Here we go. Had to eat meat occasionally what? and weren't like spindly and bent over from malnutrition and broken at age 20. Like that's all it took to be a superior physical specimen warrior in the old days was like, guess having decent meals once in a while. So, so that it, just drinking milk could be that big separation between a fit society and one that is easily conquered because all you've had to eat were is rice for a century. You know, like it's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm yep. just thinking about how the barter system and dowries and things like that, based on goats and cows and stuff, would not be very helpful if you could not drink milk. Yeah. I give you 30 goats uh, to milk uh, for your dowry. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to let her milk. anywhere near it because yeah. I like to be. Yeah. <laughs> But it is interesting that it has stuck around and it hasn't, it, the genes have not kept up the, I mean, probably has to do with agri modern agriculture and the spread of the availability of food, but the genes have not uh, kept up their spread globally. Uh, still people, definitely a large number of people have lactase persistence, mm -hmm. but a very large number of people do not. But well, you could expect that number to increase for those who don't have it, because I, I don't feel like we have a, an agricultural based society that is expressly reliant on any given food source at this point. Right. That's, for yeah, most exactly. Of it. Yeah. Uh, that you. you yeah. Uh, those people. Those people are no longer going to be drummed out of society for not being able to eat ice cream. 
<laughs> no, you can't eat ice cream. Get out of town. You <laughs> go live in the ocean. <laughs> All right. Uh, my last story for the night has to do with surviving the cold, cold nights. We've talked before on the show about torpor. Blair's talked about torpor. We've talked about it's not hibernation. It's torpor. It's the, the body's metabolism decreases. The heartbeat is still going. It's not quite the same decrease in temperature that hibernation entails. There are some birds that do it. Hummingbirds are among them. And a new study out of uh, out of New Me University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, researchers have looked at a number of, I think they have 26 hummingbirds from six different species. Yeah, that's what it is. Six different species of hummingbirds that they collected in the Andes the researchers wanted to know how different hummingbirds use torpor at different higher elevations. So they're up in the Andes where temperatures get really cold. They collected a bunch of hummingbirds and then they put them in little enclosures near the campsite and put a little temperature collecting wire up their cloacas to see what would happen because how else are you going to record temperature it's science, man it's science you got to put a wire up a bird's cloaca <sighs> anyhow this wire tracked the body temperatures overnight and every species of the six that they had went into torpor one species they had a number of different sizes one of them was the giant hummingbird which is about double the size of the 12 centimeter long metal tail hummingbird. The metal tail hummingbird, its body temperature dipped to 3.3 degrees Celsius, which is about 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -mm. Almost what? to freezing. Yes. Yes, it is one of the it is the lowest temperature that has been recorded in so, a bird in a non hibernating animal. So, OK, so what's interesting there is that that's like a temperature you if you were going to uh, take a bacterial sample and you want it not to grow, uh, you want it to you're not going to freeze it. You're not going to kill it. You're just going to put it in cold storage so that you slow you put it into a. G zero state where it's not, it's, it's no, zero growth is taking place. You do that mm -hmm. under uh, about 40 degrees. You do it at about where uh, this bird has put itself, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. And the birds, they, they look as though they are dead. They don't move. You can pick them mm. up. They're, they're, mm. They don't do anything. They're just kind of dead. Mm. But then in the morning when the sun comes up, they warm back up again and mm. they fly away. And they are happy and they think about their alien abduction and how strange that was. So over <laughs> overnight, this change happens because like overnight, I think about the extreme temperature changes in bears because they're like the obvious example. Right. And they're they're lowering their temperature steadily for a while. And then they stay at that lower temperature for weeks to months. And then they raise it back up. It seems like it wouldn't be beneficial to spend all the energy to push it back up for only one night. That seems crazy. It does, but it is what they are doing. It is an overnight change. They drop that substantially. Uh, some some of the hummingbirds do not drop. I mean, the majority of hummingbirds didn't drop that substantially. Uh, the average was uh, reaching body temperatures of five to 10 degrees Celsius, which is still not, you know, it's not that low, um, but it's significantly lower than when they're active. And uh, the interesting thing though, in terms of the trade-off in the Peruvian Andes, the birds are going to be roosting up in a tree, up on a, in a crack on a ledge. Uh, they're going to find a place to hide for the night 
to and not move, but there are not a lot of prey species or predator species, predatory mm -hmm. species that are going to come and take advantage of it. So they may have sufficient food and nutrition to be able to support the meta metabolic costs. And since they don't have the predatory cost, then it might be an adequate trade-off. Hmm. I don't know, but it's pretty amazing. This is the most extreme hummingbirds. They're, they're extreme, really dropping their body temperatures. And now like you, we've talked, every time we talk about what a cool animal is doing in extreme situations, how can we now apply this to humans? How can we apply understanding how they drop their temperature and raise it back up again with no physiological negative effects that we can see? How do they do that? And how could we do that for, say, surgeries or mm -hmm. for, um, you know, any, yeah, any kind of healthcare procedures that we might need to use it for? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the chat room, Goldisator is asking how much energy it would take to maintain temperature all night for something so mm. small. And that's actually a very good question because it could be that is the trade off because mm -hmm. hummingbirds take so much energy to maintain their metabolism. Right. So if you think about they're so small, so it's easier bear, to just lose that heat. Right. So a bear is really good at conserving heat because they're yeah. big. So their surface area to mass is it allows them to conserve energy. But yeah, a teeny tiny little hummingbird, their surface area to mass is very different. So yes, they're they're gonna lose heat a lot faster than a bear would. Yeah. But it's still it still is a huge metabolic undertaking to push your internal body temperature back up after going into torpor. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Hummingbirds, these little teeny 12 centimeters long. Like that's tiny the tiny little animal is like i'm gonna freeze okay i'm fine now <laughs> okay okay it's amazing that does it for me for stories does anybody have anything else they want to talk about no nothing else all right, everybody, if you have questions for us, you can ask questions. We will take your questions and try to answer them. If you have questions, send them to me on Facebook, facebook.com that slash 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 This Week in Science or Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com for email. And we will answer your questions on the show. We'd love to get your questions. I think that does it for us. Does it do it? It does. Yes, it I'm does. hoping for a less pumpkin spice sky tomorrow. Fingers <sighs> crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed for everyone on the West Coast who is affected by the fires. Yes, let's have let's have a good night. Let's have the wind die down and the flames drop to little embers and homes be saved and the skies I mean, return to if, blue. Uh, if uh, hey mother mother nature if you want to throw us some rain that would be helpful that would be awesome <laughs> that would be wonderful just no lightning all right none of that just some rain yeah thank you for listening to the show i hope you enjoyed it i really really do hope you enjoyed it Shout outs to Fada for your help with our show notes and for social media help. Thank you to Gord for helping to man the chat room, making it go, go, go. And for Identity4 for recording the show. And I would like to thank the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gorov Sharma, Josiah Zayner, Mike Shoemaker, Sarah Forfar, Donald Mundus, Gerald Slurels, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Corinne Benton, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Ben Bignell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, 
Richard Brian Minish, Brendan Minish, Melisande, Johnny Gridley, Flying Out, Richard Reporter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Bizarros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, June Drapeau, Sarah Chavis, Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Namber, Kosti Ranke, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S., Ed Dyer, oh, Stone, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkids, Brian Condren, Jason Roberts, and David Friedel. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if any of you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information at twist.org. Click that Patreon link. On next week's show, I have a thing written down here that's not true. Okay, here it went. On next week's show, we will be back Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org live. Hey, uh, want to use your, your ear hairs to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, uh, get some friends to listen with their ear hairs, too. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. That's right. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, into the subject line or your email will go into torpor, fall asleep, and we'll never read it. Nope. <laughs> you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news and if you've learned anything from the show remember it's all in your head <laughs> this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy! Jeopardy! And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Thank you.
I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. Oh my goodness. Uh -oh. It was because it was it was all day, all day today. It was. All day, all day. My cat is down here purring and shedding. She says, come pet me in clouds of cat hair. Thank you all for watching, for being a part of this tonight. Thank you. And I saw the, uh, hey, Jens, you had to pop in and out. Thank you for being a part. Alex, Troiano, Goldizator, Eric Knapp, Hot Rod, Identity Four, Gord McLeod. Who else? Noodles. We got all sorts of people. We got all sorts of people. Thunder Beaver, Eric and AK. Gorov, Fada, the people. Who are the people in our neighborhood? <laughs> you are. Um, I saw Gorov post petition to make Ed Dyer and a permanent patron of the show in the name list. Eric Knapp seconded the motion. I think, I think that we have a, I think that would be good. I could do that. Perma patron Ed Dyer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, we're right here, Jens. That's right. <laughs> Hot Rod. Let's see. What are you doing over there? You guys over in the the web chat on Freenode are talking about Discord and talking about Lime Chat. Yeah, people kept getting booted, including myself. I got booted out of our chat room four times today. <laughs> yeah, I saw at some point you were Blair 66 and yeah, you were all and sorts I was of Blair 96. So many different Blairs so tonight. So many Blairs. So many. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. How oh, is Dave Fried all around anywhere? Oh my God, I've got the yawns. I swear, I held them in mostly during the show and now they're like, Bleh, it's time to yawn itself out. Mm. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yeah, I... Uh... I really am hoping for not another day like this. Um, How many days has it been? I mean, it was really bad I mean, today. Today was the only been... day it was dark. So yeah. Garav, same thing. So he's, he said, I woke up this morning thinking my alarm went off early. So I woke up late. I like had trouble getting out of bed. And then I got out of bed and I looked, uh, I like walked by my window to my balcony. I was like, what? 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 <laughs> And um, so, yeah, so it looked like it was still like 5 a.m. outside. And then I looked up the air quality because I was like, uh oh, this isn't good. Like there's a tint out there. And it said it was fine because San Francisco, the Bay Area 
has a marine layer. So this is the, the cool thing yeah, about the Bay Area is we have our upwelling right here. So that pushes the cold water up. And that also means that there's uh, air, cool ocean air being pushed towards the um, the shore. And that gets pushed over and up. And so yeah. that means that all of the smoke was high enough up that it was blocking out the sun. But our air quality was actually pretty good. Oh. Um, so, like, I was able to go for a run today. The The air was fine. How weird, really? Just yeah. red. Yeah. So the, the, the air quality was fine because none of the smoke was down here. Yeah, All the coastal. You have that above the mean. Huh. Yeah, so the entire Bay Area had this very weird thing where we were blacked out. We had this like blood red sky, but then we had, um, yeah, our air quality was fine. Huh. Hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah this is the don't... only day that it was dark. Yesterday yeah. it just kind of looked yucky. Yeah. We didn't get smoke up here. Really, it has been off and on hazy, but we really got smoke up here this evening. I watched, I watched it get really? darker, I... darker and darker, and more and more orange because there's a fire that's really not that far <laughs> from southeast Portland. Okay. So, because because according yeah. to uh, the president of the United States, uh, Portland has been burning for decades, apparently. Right. Yes, Isn't we've that... always we've been on fire yeah, for so and we long. Just need to rake. So that's really our problem. California just needs to get out the rakes. Go rake that forest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, let's get out of rake. Let's go do that. Everybody grab your rakes. <sighs> yeah. Yes, Alex, 2020 is such a year. Everybody, everybody, <laughs> everybody's, we've all gotten to the point where we're like, you just, it's like, oh, something else crazy and terrible. Of course. Yeah. Of course yeah, it is. Just, okay. It's just yeah. every time right. I'm like, okay, okay, I think I've got a handle on this thing. Okay, I think I found no. a new normal. Okay, I think I have a plan. Even not a new normal, uh, but I just have a plan for the next 48 hours. I think I can figure this out. And then something else happens. Yikes. Oh, no. Identity says he thinks his old apartment burned down last night. Oh, what? Wow. That's not good. At least... You weren't there anymore. Bah. Eric in Alaska has had the fun of a gray sky caused by volcanic ash. Oh. Wait, where did a volcano so spew is ash? Is it currently or is in that, the past? In the past? I, I've been so focused on the fires. I'm not paying attention to volcanoes. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's, what's going on? Yeah, and there are these four guys riding horses coming down the street. One of them had a flaming sword. Okay, years ago. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks. <laughs> like, I can't uh, do it. Hey, I mean, I, I expect it, but oh, God. <laughs> it's gotten so bad in Denmark that they are talking about closing bars at midnight now. Oh, is it starting to ratchet back, back up again? Yeah. Or is... Of course it is, because, uh, because, the, because of the lack of... Uh, Cases over a prolonged period of time, having shut down and, and dealt with the cases so significantly. Um, the the traditional uh, Danes get a lot more uh, vacation time than uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. A lot more. And it's traditional to take a summer vacation, which uh, apparently a lot of the population did in other countries, which have not the problem as well. Now the cases, guys, uh, cases still guys, aren't. Hey, I know, I know. It's a well, pandemic. Like, um, <laughs> excuse so, me. <laughs> okay, so so I went to a uh, one of the biggest malls in Copenhagen uh, over this past weekend uh, to get uh, the eye test and to order some glasses. And was one of the only people wearing a face mask. Nobody working, the population mulling through, nobody's wearing face masks. And I felt like screaming at the top of my lungs, hey, there's a band like a mole rat, like a, like a naked mole rat <laughs> screaming in this and then, cavern. 
of a and mob. Then, and There's then everybody else would be like, what? What? Yeah. I can't yeah. hear you. That's kind of I, what it I felt. don't know what you I can't hear you now. But because it's because it's um you know there's there's definitely uh, they've definitely done an uh the, the 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 government and the people have reacted properly early on and there's definitely not been the caseload that you have seen in other countries but with that has come complacency uh, mm -hmm. I think as well. So the you know they are Still being affected like anywhere else, uh, not to the degree yet, but uh, recent spikes have started to cause people to take uh, a, a few more precautions. Yeah. Still not the level but I think not that's... Not enough, uh, though. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, again, we've talked about this before. Uh, I was suggesting three. I've heard as much as six weeks of just global timeout. Just everybody Stop. Yeah, it would be. Places. That's what. That's what our uh, our our guest Dr. doctor Faust Faust. Faust what? He, yeah, he said. Six. He said more. We were like six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, he said and six. Actually, I what he great. was and and it wasn't very. It was. He also wasn't saying it was specific, but up to six. Uh, but it would depend. It would depend. Could be more depending on the severity and the situation in different areas. Uh, Tim and Tenor problem. says like, even even immunity. back in, in April, yeah. I feel like somebody saying six weeks of shutdown, people would be like, no, no, yeah. that's too long. But and even now they'd be like, oh, we've already been shut down for so long. No, no, no. Six weeks is too long. But the, it, it would actually make it shorter. But I feel like it's it's this thing of like, you know, I don't want to invest more now. It's like, <laughs> no, I can't spend that much money on a burrito. I'm going to buy this. Yeah. You burrito just, off, you off just, the street and then pay for it later. You know, it's yeah, like you just <laughs> you just get it. You get it over with. I'm mean, gonna inform too. The uh, the the recent spike in Denmark is mostly amongst students. It's mostly young people congregating. You know, the thing that we've been seeing. It's it's also happened in the United States. All these colleges that opened up. Uh, yeah, you know, and one of the worst initial reactions. I can't remember which university it was. They had dormitories that were. You know, they they. They had cases break out. And so what did they do? They sent the students home, which sounds like, okay, we have COVID problems. Let's send everybody home. Problem is, they just sent them around the country. And then there was apparently mm -hmm. like parents coming to collect uh, clothes. And so they're walking down hallways, passing each other, collecting all their goods when they in these closed dormitories. Like, this is insanity. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's taking place, uh, but it's, it's been brought immunity. up. But it's brought up uh, herd immunity is being brought up in uh, the uh, one of the chat rooms here. Um, to get to herd immunity in the United States, you have to have over fifty percent of the population have it. And when you get into that, you're talking about then uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three million people would die to get yeah. to that point. So that's it's it's can we a, not do that? It's a possibility, but it's not the good one. Yeah, it's not that's the good like, one. And can we can we try and postpone good. it to get a vaccine? Can we try and push it off? Can we can we just try to do that? Please. Yeah. That be uh, and can we also make sure that it's a vaccine that's that's ready to go and is not being pushed forward based ooh, on ooh, ooh. a political deadline? That would be yeah, great. So, so we've talked about this a lot and the Russian vaccine. Apparently, there is a story on Ars, Tec Ars Technica today or like within the last day or two about the Russian vaccine saying that the original phase one, phase two trial that they mm -hmm. published, where they actually published the results, that it looks like, and they're saying, they're not saying they found bad data, but what they are saying is that it looks like, like one section of the data looks very similar to another section of the data and it shouldn't. That we like, basically there's like paste. a cop. Right there, there, like there was a copy and paste in there, and that the similarities are just a little bit too strong. But they haven't; they don't have the data to look at. So, yeah. So everything's fine. Yeah. That's well, great. Yeah, I mean, there's that, and then there's <laughs> our leader who has said that uh, magically we will receive a vaccine just before a very special date, or after. 
Oh, but only if only if I'm reelected. So so here's the other thing. Uh, to keep in mind when we're also talking about uh, again herd immunity or recovery rates or all of this sort of stuff. We're still just getting glimpses at long-term effects, which sound in some cases extremely severe and persistent. So you, it, it's not just like a cold that you get over. Apparently, there's long-lasting side effects to this yeah. going forward. So even those who, who end up with the herd immunity because they've gotten it aren't necessarily going to be healthy afterwards. Yeah, it's it's not good uh, news, people. You should take it seriously. No, it's not. Somebody was reminding me that I live near a whole bunch of volcanoes. There's a couple of people, Kevin and mm -hmm. Eric in Alaska, and fault lines, telling me that I, I live around a bunch of volcanoes. And it's every phenomenal. time I think about all the volcanoes and the fires that are happening right now, I just think to myself, I live in a burning ring of fire. <laughs> I went down, down, yeah, down, down, flames, flames they got went higher, higher. <laughs> and I burned, 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 burned that ring that of fire, fire that, that ring, of, ring fire. of fire, the taste of love is sweet when hearts <laughs> like ours beat. I don't know the rest of the lyrics. I need to learn the rest of the lyrics. Better. I fell for you like a child. Ooh, the fire went higher. Oh, I thought it was wild. The fire was wild. Oh, maybe uh, that's maybe yeah. it makes more mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, actually, I saw a really cool um one last thing about the vaccine that I thought was really interesting. I saw a really cool thread on Twitter, and I wish I could find it again and retweet it. I'll have to look. Um, but it was about um how you measure the efficacy of a vaccine. And the way you measure it is you actually uh, have to multiply how effective the vaccine itself is times public trust. Because if you have a vaccine that is 100% effective, but only 50% of the, the, of the population trust it, it is only a 50% effective vaccine. If you have an 80% yeah. effective vaccine and, you know, 50% of the population trusts it, then it's only a 40% effective vaccine. Something right? seems mm -hmm. wrong with your algebra, but other than that, the timesing thing, I don't understand. It. But uh, that's okay. It's times 40%? Time. If 25%? No, if, wait. If, 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 if it's 100% effective, yes. And 50% of the population take it, yes. Because we trust it. Yes. There's only a 50% effectiveness of that vaccine. That made sense. If it is 80% effective, and 50% of the population trust it. It is only 40% yes. effective. Yes. Yes. Good night, Brian. She says, good, good night, morning. Brian. Or good morning. Does. Is it good morning? Is he no, starting his day? It's yeah. good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so trust is an important metric in the efficacy of a vaccine. So that actually means that the, um, that the disseminating of information and the way that a vaccine is uh, kind of represented to the general public is actually an important metric in how effective a vaccine is. Therefore, going out as the leader of a country and saying, I'm going to get you this vaccine by election day, um, impacts trust in a vaccine and therefore actually impacts the efficacy. Mm -hmm. So That's a great point. So it was a very, it was very interesting. Like, oh, so he's like actually messing up any vaccine that's brought forward because people yeah. are going to be the people that would trust a vaccine are now going to be skeptical of it. Yep. Yep. We don't, and we don't need that. He's no fumble, fumble, fumble. Um, HNEK <laughs> says, I am working at a co college dorm room. Dor I can't speak. I am working at a college dorm right now. They've already had one positive case. Oh, geez. Ugh. Yeah, if I mean, it depends on how they're taking care of it, because some colleges, it seems, are managing this these issues better than other colleges. And I mean, we're really hearing about the ones where they're not handling it better. But I hope that I hope that you are able to stay safe. Uh, and, I, and I just I just I want to tell uh, people uh, I've been drinking bleach for years. 
No. Uh, and I still get I still get colds. So it's it's not going to don't don't try it. Don't listen to Justin. Don't, don't, do, that. don't do that. Don't, don't do, do that. that at all. Bleach is dangerous. Don't 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 drink of the bleach. It's not good. Don't drink of the uh isopropyl alcohol either. Don't do that. Either. Don't do that. It's not good for you. Nope. Ammonia. And the only way the only way to effectively put light inside of your body is to open up your body, like during a surgery. And put so a light bulb in not, there. No. Not, uh, <laughs> I did once know somebody who refused to believe that their partner went to the bathroom and just said that um, white light came out of her. Huh? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he refused, what? refused to talk about bodily functions. So it's white light, mm. white light. Mm. Okay. <sighs> <laughs> I think that might do it. Hey, uh, say good night, Blair. Good night, uh, Blair. Say good night, Justin. I can't. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Oh. Um, good. and. Good night. Oh, oh, wait, oh, I hold it. Hold on to something. She's saying yeah, something. I hold it to the end. I'll say good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Good night, everyone. I uh, I put a little poll up on the Science Island Facebook page for those of you who are interested in uh, getting together to uh, celebrate Ed Dyer's life and how, how we knew him. Um, I will put a link in for science our, for our online Science Island space on associated with that in the Science Island um, post. It looks like Sunday at 11 a.m. is what the majority of people have responded will work for them. I know that doesn't work for everybody, and I apologize for that. But if you have um, messages or anything that you want to share, you can send them to me and I, or Justin, and uh, we can, I don't think Blair will be able, maybe Blair might be able to make it depending on whether things get better on the fire smoke front there. Um, but yeah, send, send us anything that you would like us to share at the gathering and we will do that for you if you're not able to make it, but it looks like Sunday at 11 AM and I will share a link on Facebook for the twists and Science Island pages. Alrighty. Um, so some of you I will see or hear in our Science Island space on Sunday and others of you, I hope that you have a wonderful week. I hope everyone stays safe. I hope I really have said it before and I'll say it again. This These West Coast fires are, they're a lot. So they, I hope they're not putting people over the edge. Take care of yourselves and keep listening to the science because it does bring a little bright spot and a little curiosity and a little inspiration in what otherwise seems kind of bleak at the moment. So thank you for letting us be a part of your week. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk. Talk. Bye. Bye. Good night.